Parents, parents, sponsors, San Olympia committee members, visitors, guests, and volunteers. And uh, if anybody I missed, you are welcome to um, this uh, 18th uh, annual San Olympia. Um, with the hard work of everyone, everyone, I mean every single one of us in this auditorium, we had yet another successful San Olympia. Nothing happens by accident in this, in this life. In, in this life, and I'm sure you all find your roles in this process. I want to, do, to thank the GCC president, GCC staff, and every one of you making this happen. If not loud, you can say, yes, we did it. Uh, we are so happy to see how our young Armenian generation is interested in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. During the years when I was doing my master's degree in computer science, there weren't many female engineers, not only in software field, but in all other engineering and science fields. Today, seeing so many young Armenian female students interested in STEM give us, gives us joy. Um, with this, I want to introduce you with another su successful female scientist, Nora Jankochen. She is the year's winner of the 18th Science Olympiad Judges Award. She has been an ISA member for many years, then Science Olympiad Committee member, and Science Olympiad Judge for many years. She has Master of Science in Biology and has been involved in medical research for 40 years, in, in first in basic science, then later into clinical research, working at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Los Angeles. Mrs. Jean Cochin is now running clinical trials in the area of kidney dialysis and GI procedures and have several published scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals. She is also a member of Armenian Professional Society, LA, serving as president in 1992. She has been very active supporter of scientific research, especially at the middle and high school levels serving as science fair judge in many schools, as well as the LA County and California, California State Science Fairs. We are so lucky to have her in our team. She's always encouraged Armenian youth to go into the sciences and have mentored several, several of them, not only for the science fairs, but in getting them to volunteer in research and assisting them in choosing their futures. I want to invite her to the podium to receive her award. Nora uh, this award, uh, as, as I'm going to read it, is um, the Armenian Engineers and Scientists of America. Uh, the Judge Mentor Award goes to Nora Jankochan for your commitment to ASA Science Olympiad and the difference you made in the lives of Armenian students that distinguishes you as the mentor and judge of the year for 2018. speaker, a young successful engineer who has been ISO member for several years, supporting Science Olympiad as a judge and exhibitor presenting robot parts to kids that he brought from NASA JPL. And now he, he will be standing on this podium as a keynote speaker. Vladimir Artinov is a mechanical engineer in robotic vehicles and man manipulators group at NASA Jet Population Laboratory. He is the son of RSI Science Olympiad Public Relations lead Svetlana Aritinova. Not only his family, but we all are so proud to see and hear about his achievements and wish him success in his career. Vladimir Arutunov received the ISA YPRO Young Engineer Award for his outstanding achievements and contributions in the field of mechanical engineer as an intern at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 2015. Also last year, Mars Exploration Directorate presented Voyager Award to Vladimir 
for outstanding technical excellence developing and conducting the replacement of faulty robotic arm force torque sensor in VSTB. Today he will be presenting about learning by doing and why you should care about knowing how to think. I'm very excited to hear about it. Let's welcome him to the podium. Thank you very much. That was a really amazing introduction. I uh, wonder who my mom got to. to uh, so, thank you all so much for coming. Students, uh, thank you so much for the work you've put in. Uh, even for the payoffs that you're getting in the short term, it's hard to imagine the payoffs you'll get in the long term. So, you did it. I'm uh, speaking to the students here, I mean, I, I know the parents have contributed a lot, and ASA and GCC, thanks for hosting us, has contributed a lot. Um, and Nora, congratulations on your award. Uh, but you guys, I'm, I'm talking to you, and for the rest of this talk, I'm talking directly to you. Uh, you know, your parents can listen, they don't have to leave, but this is really for you. Uh, and when I ask questions, if, if, if please everyone, if only the students could uh, raise hands. Um, so, you, uh, you worked hard, you spent a lot of time, uh, you worked through your project, uh, you struggled, uh, you made some mistakes, you learned some lessons. Um, but uh, I'm sure you all have different reasons for why you did it. Um, so I want to ask a few of you, uh, why did you do it? Why did you do this, this science that we had? Anyone? No wrong answer. Even bad answers are, are good here. Anyone? Just, just yell it out. What's that? Yeah, you. I did it for the fun. For what? Because it was really fun. Because it was fun? That's a, that's a pretty good reason. Any other reasons? Here's some whispers, but maybe... Maybe, maybe a lot of different reasons. So fun's a pretty good reason. Um, maybe the reason a few of you are being silent uh, right now is maybe your teachers told you to do it. Maybe your teachers told you it was a pretty good idea to do it. Yeah, there's a, there's a raised hand. Uh, maybe your, your parents told you to do it, right? Your parents said, do the Science Olympiad, it's very good for you, right? I just did it because uh, Maybe you were bored, right? Maybe you're just like an ultra nerd and you just, this is how you want to spend your Sunday. Um, I heard fun, that's a pretty good reason. Um, maybe you did it because your friends have their reasons for doing it, and you're like, ah, you know, my friend is doing it, so I'll just do it too. That's, that's not a bad reason either. All these are pretty good reasons. Uh, maybe you wanted to learn. Maybe you're like, man, I wonder which of these designs actually yield the best results. Like, I want to know. That's a pretty good reason too. Um, and that's actually the reason I want to focus on today, uh, is learning. Learning is uh, it's something that doesn't ever stop even if you try, um, but it's something that you, you can actively be doing you know, for the rest of your life. Learning doesn't stop when you leave school. Uh, learning doesn't stop when you leave school uh, at the, in the afternoon. Uh, and I want to um, make a distinction between the kind of learning you do when you go to school and, and learn math uh, and the kind of learning you do when you are engaging in these projects. Uh, and working on these things outside of school, either working in teams or by yourself, but actually struggling through like a real problem. That's a very different kind of learning. Um, it's not the learning that happens when you absorb new knowledge, like what is the CPEC effect someone had, or, or why do trusses uh, behave differently when bridges are used uh, for bridges rather than, than just simple beams or arches. Like, those are technical questions and it's important to learn those too. Um, but I'm talking about learning how to think. Uh, this is a very different kind of learning and uh, it's a learning that actually makes you better at learning everything else. Um, but learning how to think, I mean, you might think, like, who is this guy? Like, oh, I know how to think. Like, everyone knows how to think. Look, two plus two, that's four, right? There, I'm thinking. Um, I'm not talking about the difference between learning how to think or knowing how to think and not knowing how to think at all. 
that's not what I'm saying. Um, rather, there is a big difference uh, between the way you think now and how well you think now, and in what ways you can, are able to think, uh, and learning how to think uh, better. There's a big difference. And this is, um, it's about being able to think better than you thought before. Uh, there's, you know, there's a reason you go to school, and it's actually this reason. Uh, you're not going to school because you're expected to remember every date in your history class. You're not going to school because you're expected to memorize every equation in the math textbook. You're going to school because it will be useful to you and you will be really grateful later in life that you actually know how to use those equations. Um, that you actually know what the significance of those dates were. Um, and so, there's... Um, there's some assumptions I want to make for the rest of this discussion. Uh, and I really want it to be a discussion. You guys should feel free to raise hands and, and ask questions. Um, there's uh, an assumption I want to make, which is that if you're here, if you participated in the Olympiad, um, you probably have you know, some interest already uh, in, in science, in math, uh, in biology, in technology. Um, there's lots of different interest areas you could have. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not something that stays constant over time, though. Your interests change over time. And your interests, um, just because they change over time, doesn't mean that they're not important when you have them. Um, but I'm going to assume, for the rest of this discussion, your interests are probably clustering around one set of ideas. And if not, that's okay, too. Um, hopefully I get something out of this discussion, too. Uh, but for those of you interested in creating, in learning, in making, in discovering, in breaking things, in making things new, uh, understanding how the world works, understanding how things work, nature, the universe, uh, there's, there's a, a few uh, things to keep in mind, which is that those interests change over time. And if we're talking about uh, time, then we're really talking about the difference between you and you in the future. Um, and if we're talking about you in the future, then what we really need to talk about um, is, how, is how time works. So, uh, every day has the same amount of time. When people tell you, I don't have time for that, they actually have exactly the same amount of time you have. Uh, it's just how you want to spend your time, right? Um, the thing that is a time tax on all of us, right, that we don't get to choose, uh, that you should know by now, and don't worry, this won't change for the rest of your life. Uh, you need to sleep. Uh, you, don't get, you don't get a choice about that, unfortunately. Um, if you do it less, it's pretty bad for you. Um, if you do it too much, you lose out on other things. But, so it takes about a third of your day. Um, another thing you're eventually going to have to do, and currently that's school, uh, you're going to have to figure out how you want to spend your time. Um, for most of the day. Right now, this is basically decided for you. Um, maybe you have problems with that. Uh, that's fine. Maybe that's an interesting discussion to have. But right now, for you, that's cool. When you graduate school, you're going to actually have to decide what you want to do differently, what, how you actually want to spend your life. Now, there's a third category, which is um, the thing that you, not, not the area of things that you focus on and, and try to drive in your life. Um, but there's sort of the rest of your life, the part of your life that's supposed to be not about trying to achieve things or trying to do things or figure things out for yourself, but just have fun and relax and have meaningful relationships and um, try to be a good person and, and all, on all these kinds of things that add meaning and, and joy to our lives. This is kind of like how each day is split up, roughly. Um, and if we just consider these three categories and we start to parse them out, um, we start to see that this isn't just how each day roughly runs. This is, you know, each, each day is the same, and each week has seven 24-hour days, and so on, and so on, and so on. A third of your life, a third of your entire life is sleep. And a third of your entire life is building meaningful relationships and trying to be a good person and having fun. And then a third of, the rest of the third is this whole thing you have to figure out, which is, how, what am I going to do with my life? Um, so, if these are the three sort of main categories, um, you may notice that there, there's something 
a piece of this puzzle that is kind of missing, which is how, how are you going to be able to sustain this? Um, and there's an unfortunate reality about this, which is that you've got to use this third to be able to earn some money to be able to support the other two thirds. And this is, um, I used to think pretty cynically about this and I kind of come around. Um, because there's a way to think about this that is actually uh, a really, really important point um, that's important to, to learn early on. So let's take, let's take, let's make an experiment right now, which you guys have some experience with now. Let's make a little experiment where instead of being in the phase where we're still figuring this out, let's make some assumptions. So on, in life one, you can not pay attention to what it is that you're doing and only pay attention to uh, getting that, that little flying dollar sign emoji. Um, that's one approach. There's another approach where you don't only just consider that, but you also consider what it is you're doing to be able to sustain the rest of your life. Um, so these are two very different approaches. And uh, since you all you know, take math, you can see if we cancel out that sleeping third, right, you're left if we, with a two-third and a two-third comparison, right? So let's call that the baseline. Everyone, you know, regardless of the option, you have to sleep. This option is 50% as good as this option, right? Um, so that should, you should, that should be glaringly, alarmingly, uh, like, noisy in your mind, that, like, choosing approach one is a, is a big error, and uh, it's an error a lot of people, unfortunately, fall to, um, fall into, and preventing this early on will mean that later in your life, you'll look back on it and say, man, boy, I'm really glad I spent it this way rather than that way. Now, um, if we're on the same page, let's assume for a moment that you'd rather have option two. Well, there's some preconditions, which I kind of touched on, but haven't spelled out in one list yet. I'm an engineer, I like requirements. So here's some requirements to make this happen. Um, you have to be good enough at it that you can do it. You need to enjoy it, or else, I mean, you'll just, I mean, you'll either be neutral or you'll be miserable, unless you enjoy it. Um, and you have to get paid for it. So this seems like a pretty basic list, but it's actually sometimes difficult to make all three match. Um, now, you may be thinking, like, okay, whatever, I knew this. Like, yes, it's possible to have an awesome life. Like, this is not news to anyone. Um, now, the point of this, uh, one of the points of this talk uh, is why you should care about doing anything. And uh, this has been, in the past, a really general point that everyone has kind of agreed on and thought a lot about for centuries. That thinking is important and being able to think well is important. I'm not gonna, you guys know that. Um, but it's actually, I'm sorry guys, some bad news. It's actually way more important um, now, at this period in human history, to think well uh, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of skillful ways that people on average haven't had to as much. So you guys, you got, a, you got an interesting uh, hand in the dog. Um, so there's something else that's not captured in this, in this list of requirements, which is that um, this thing that you're doing, it has to exist by the time you start. So right now, you guys are in, in middle school and high school. Um, later, if the thing you're trying to do to fill in that third doesn't exist, that's a problem. Now you might think, why wouldn't this exist? So there's some good news and some bad news. There are lots of lines of work that fill in those first three requirements, right? Um, there's actually a pretty big list. You know, you, you don't, and I'm not just talking about STEM. Like there's, there's lots of ways you can make that work for yourself. Um, but they might not exist when you graduate, and that's because uh, one out of three jobs in the United States, I'm not even talking about global statistics, but one out of three jobs in the United States uh, is at risk of disappearing uh, by 2030. So that's in 11 years from now. Now, if this is a scary statistic, that, that's because it is. It is definitely a scary statistic. Um, this is from the McKinsey uh, Institute. Um, and 
The global statistics look, look pretty similar, but since we're in the U.S., we'll just talk about this. Um, anyone, anyone have any idea why this might happen? Some of you guys should. Technology. Technology, yeah. It's automation, yeah. So this has been talked about in the news a lot. Um, sometimes it's discussed as though it's science fiction, as though this is like something that's going to happen later. You know, th this particular set of numbers and conditions, this is going to be true later, yes. But we're in the middle of that process now, and we've been in this process for years. So, um, the economies ad adapt and adjust sometimes, but the change that's coming is not going to be like changes that have come in the past. And it's going to require different things of you. Um, so automation is, is a word that's used um, a little loosely sometimes, but let's, let's think of it in, in two ways. There's hardware automation, and there's software automation. And sometimes the automation question is, is both. Um, but it's, it's, let's think of it generally in those two categories. Um, now, what automation is good at is repetitive tasks, uh, regardless of, of if it's hardware or software, it's good at repetitive tasks um, that don't require judgment, don't require complex creative problem solving. Um, but it's bad at things that require that. It's bad at things that require social skills. It's bad at things that require creativity. It's bad at things that require complex problem solving, and especially judgment and ethical decisions. I mean, people have been arguing over right and wrong for thousands of years. Um, and when you actually put um, ethical and moral decisions into practice, which you need to do when you are any kind of professional, whether it's a scientist, engineer, doctor, lawyer, or whatever, you're putting moral and ethical decisions to practice every day, um, you, uh, you, you guys are going to be better than automation at that for a long time. Uh, it's also particularly bad at responding to surprises. Now, this, this list of requirements, um, you may think, okay, so thinking back to that, that thirds diagram, if I want to make that set of conditions true for myself, well, then it kind of sounds like what you're getting at is I should really focus on these skills, right? So which book do I read, right? Which book do I read? to teach me creative problem solving, and teach me social skills, and teach me, you know, which class do I take. Um, and unfortunately, there's no book uh, for this, um, because uh, knowing about something is totally different than knowing it. And uh, the reason that these experiences that you're in right now, and that you're going to be in for the next few years, uh, hopefully, is the reason it's so important is because you're getting learning done now that you're not going to learn uh, in many other ways. So there's a huge overlap between uh, the skills you'll need in the future, and I really just mean you, like literally you guys in your generation and every generation afterward. Um, this isn't a problem that your parents have had to, to go through. Um, so learning these skills, there's a huge overlap between what you will need and what you get when you do things like this. And it may not feel that way today because some of you, this is your first time doing it, maybe it's your second or third time doing it, and each time the change in your capabilities is so small that it's hard to notice. But, and you, you rather more notice the short-term gains, like I learned these things, I learned these specific things. Um, but over time, you're going to learn how to think uh, much better than... Um, than you were able to in the past, and that's going to make the difference in the future. And that's going to be able to, um, to make the difference in making a set of life conditions for yourself that you can be really happy about later. This is why your parents and your teachers and the coaches and the judges volunteer their time to help you guys out with this, is because uh, we're trying to, trying to invest in, in your future. And, uh, it requires, on your guys' part, not just being like passive recipients of the, uh, of the information and advice and requirements like, you know, do science and that. It's not, that's not what it's about. Um, it's really about you guys pushing forward into the future and thinking about um, how, to, how to bring meaning and, and achievement in your life. It, it actually makes a difference. So, I want to uh, kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some of the experiences that I've had, um, and they started very early. You may, this may look familiar to uh, one of the guys and uh, the young boys in um, 
uh, joint physical sciences today. So I started out doing stuff exactly like this. Um, one of the first competitions I did was, was Science Olympiad when I, back when I lived in New York. Um, this is back in eighth grade. Yeah. So, um, sorry if the focus is not good on the bottom left. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, lots of different competitions. I, you know, I, I won some, I won most, I, I lost most, and I won some. And I'm sure that um, regardless of your, your results uh, today, you're, gonna, you're either going to think, man, I won, this is easy, I'm just going to keep doing this and win all the time. If you're winning all the time, it means you're not trying hard enough. It means you're not challenging yourself enough. And if, you're, uh, and if you lose today, you may think, well, I'm not going to do this again, I just want to keep losing. This is one of the, if, you, if you're losing today, it's perfectly normal and actually a requirement of learning. Because if you're winning all the time, you're not actually doing any learning. Um, so, there's, there's a lot more losses than there are wins, and uh, it's okay, and it should be that way. Um, so, this is a high school where, after doing like science Olympiad and math competitions uh, in 8th and ninth grade, uh, I moved to California, uh, starting in 10th grade, and uh, this is a part of my academic decathlon team. Uh, I did mock trial uh, as well, and there were other you know, competitions at the time, and I, I did some. Um, this was a lot of fun. This was a lot of uh, learning. And like science Olympiad and math competitions, it, it really chisels you. You know, it's, it's, it's grueling sometimes. Like sometimes you've got to stay late, you've got to sacrifice other things. But you come out of it like a sharpened knife. You know, you, you go in dull and you come out sharp. It's really important to actually get in on the ground and, and, and do the things that make you more capable when you come out the other side. It's not, you know, you can't just read about how to think well. It's something you actually, you actually have to practice. It's like a muscle you exercise. So um, I went to Cal State Northridge uh, in uh, 2010 and graduated in 2015. Uh, uh, I love the engineering program there. I majored in mechanical engineering. Uh, I did some undergraduate research um, in human factors, which is kind of like a neighboring field. It's a cross between engineering and psychology. Uh, and uh, I did some research there in my undergraduate. Uh, I moved on uh, to an internship eventually uh, at JPL. And the topic of that internship, uh, well, it was, it was a research project. It was a mechanical engineering research project where we were trying to build that device there, you see. So this is on a zero-G aircraft. Um, we're all floating, and there's a cube that I'm trying to grapple with that gripper. And what that gripper is, uh, you'll see a close-up in a moment. What that gripper is, is a, it's called a gecko gripper. And it has a special material that uh, can stick to things without any adhesive, suction, uh, magnetism, uh, it sticks to things uh, using these weird uh, physical phenomena called Van der Waals forces. Uh, and so the idea is that you know, we want to develop these grippers to be able to grab things and manipulate them in space without sending them flying. It can stick to things with zero force and release them with zero force. So that was the objective of the spring was to design and fabricate this thing, and then the objective of the summer was to go on a test flight and uh, try it out. So there you can see uh, the actuation and the pull-off so we were trying to, we were trying to, we were doing tests to measure how much pull-off force you can uh, achieve with that. Um, we wanted to grab a 100 kilogram test object and they wouldn't let us for safety reasons. Uh, and so we put a, a, a panel on, on, our, on the other intern, John, because that was roughly his weight. And I'm like, there we go, 100 kilogram object for free. Um, so that was fun. Um, this is, uh, that, that was a great experience. I was very lucky to, to have that early in my, um, early in my undergraduate. That was about halfway through my, my um, my senior year at Northridge, I, uh, I was the captain of this uh, aircraft design team. And so this is for uh, Society of Automotive Engineers. I know that's weird, they, but they also do air competitions. Society of, Auto Society of Automotive Engineers uh, aero competition. So this is like a quarter scale aircraft um, that has like a payload objective. And you bring in a team, uh, uh, controls people, software people, and mechanical uh, aircraft design people as like your senior project. This is like your senior class project, it takes a year. Uh, so we had a team of about 20 of us. Uh, so here's a, here's a video of the uh, takeoff of our first uh, competition <laughs> flight. <laughs> so 
This is uh, carrying, um, this, is, this is made uh, structurally entirely out of composite materials. Uh, it's carrying about, uh, about 16 kilograms, 30, 35 pounds or so, um, of cargo. Uh, and the objective of this is, is basically to you know, train mechanical engineers uh, with uh, aerospace engineering uh, expertise. And so after this, I went back to JPL and worked on this mission called, uh, oh, so we got third place in the, the competition national, that was, that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, there's uh, this mission, uh, which has since been canceled, but uh, was a JPL-led mission called the Asteroid Redirect Mission. And the idea was we were going to fly to a, an asteroid, uh, find a boulder on the surface, and use these arms and grippers, uh, arms and grippers to grab the boulder and pull it off the surface of the asteroid. So the reason for that was to then, you know, once you've got the combined mass of the asteroid, uh, sorry, of the boulder and the spacecraft, you use that as a gravity tractor to divert the original trajectory of the asteroid. Um, and so the part that uh, my, the team I was a part of at JPL during that uh, internship uh, in my senior year was the gripper team. So there was a spacecraft, it had these legs, and these arms, and at the ends of these arms are these grippers. And so these grippers uh, basically um, grip rock, that's what they're for. And uh, gripping the rock actually isn't enough for the pull-off load to grab the boulder off of the asteroid. What we had to do was put a drill inside the gripper, and that drill had these undercutting anchoring features that would then permanently anchor you into the building. And so this is uh, just a snapshot view of the, the assembly I was responsible for. So this is the drive train. This is kind of what makes it go. Um, and this is, so this was my uh, senior year of my undergrad at JPL. And eventually uh, I applied full time, and that's where I work now. So one of the things I worked on after Asteroid Redirect Mission got canceled was uh, the Curiosity rover mission. Have you guys uh, heard of this rover before? So this is, uh, it's MSL, Mars Science Laboratory. The rover's called Curiosity, for short, or for a nickname. And this uh, mission uh, launched in 2011 and landed in 2012. So it's been on the surface of Mars now for, geez, almost six years. Um, and so uh, back when it was about five years in, uh, four and a half, the drill uh, broke. There was a problem with actuating the drill mechanism and uh, you can see there that uh, there's these two big stabilizers they preload into the rock in the ground they, the, the, they push before they actually drill they push with these stabilizers and the drill bit itself then gets fed out of the drill into the rock while the arm's not moving so it's not like a drill at home uh, it's more reliable and safer that way it's a lot slower um, but it's more reliable and safer However, that feed mechanism that does that, it broke, and we had to figure out a new way to drill. So this is the engine, what's called an engineering model. This is what, like the ground twin version of what's on Mars. Uh, so my job on this was uh, to fix a faulty um, a sensor in the wrist. Uh, so it, the human analogy would kind of be like, take apart your hand, swap out a nerve in your wrist, and put your hand back together, but for a robot. And so um, I was involved in some of the testing after that, and eventually we were able to, to drill. Uh, except now, the way you drill is what's called feed extended drilling, where you are drilling with the drill bit already stuck out. And so now it's more like what you would do if you were to use a hand drill at home, except for a robot that's a lot harder and a lot more challenging. And uh, we were able to do it on Mars, and that's now how Curiosity drills. And that's sort of the bit coming out. The, the big problem with this was that we might get, we might get stuck in the rock. Uh, that's why I had to uh, go through a lot of testing. So um, the mission I work on now that I uh, left after uh, our science laboratory is the next rover coming up. So this, you may have heard of, is the Mars 2020 rover. It doesn't have a name yet, but if you want to name it, you can submit uh, an essay. There's an essay contest where students get to name the rover, and if you're the winner of the essay contest, you get to name the rover. Um, the, uh, the winner of the essay contest, by the way, she, she then eventually ended up being an intern at JPL. Um, but uh, so the 2020 rover, the purpose is to collect rock core samples from rocks on the ground on uh, Mars. And there's a coring drill, there's uh, 
a suite of instruments at the end of the robotic arm over there. And you can see that this is sort of a, this is like an artist concept of what the final assembled rover uh, will look like. Right now it's in pieces, it's still being built and tested uh, at JPL. And eventually when it gets there, it's going to be drilling into rocks, generating little pencil-sized rock cores. And those rock cores are going to be ingested into the drill. The arm is going to dock the drill into the rover's own body. And it's going to go inside an assembly that's behind this front panel, that's inside the front of the rover. And that's the, that's the assembly I work on, the caching assembly that's responsible for processing the sample. So, um, that's, that's all the overview I want to give uh, about sort of my trajectory. Um, and what you may have noticed is, you know, I didn't start working on Mars rovers right away, right? Uh, I started making like little balsa wood bridges, uh, you know, 15 years ago. So, there is, I don't know, a ridiculous amount of like incremental surprise that has happened to me uh, in my life, and it's a result of learning by doing, by trying to improve uh, constantly, by trying to listen to criticism from others, by trying to you know, make sure I was um, always you know, dedicated and trying to uh, care about becoming better at something I cared about already, which was technology and science and learning and discovery. So, uh, with that, I, I just want to leave you guys with the thought that um, there's a lot you can care about and you have to prioritize and one of the highest priorities um, should probably be uh, to care about knowing how to think because your generation especially, um, you guys are uniquely challenged uh, for the future uh, in this way. So, best of luck and uh, thanks for listening. What an amazing and uh, encouraging uh, presentation. Thank you, Vladimir, sharing your experience with everybody here. Are we coming back this year? Yes, I want to see you. What, you know, while hearing all this presentation myself, I realized that I'm an automation engineer. <laughs> so I'm causing all these jobs out there and you watch. Um, I, um, I will be happy to see everybody here. Um, with this, I wanted to invite to the podium our um, um, ISI president, um, Arai Chuchan, and And he has some uh, things to say to you as well. I would just like to make some uh, more or less summary comments. Um, each of us has come to the various fields of STEM uh, for very different reasons. But I'm sure you'll agree that each of these fields is not just a job or an occupation, but rather it's a preoccupation and a noble compulsion that becomes part of our inner fiber. For example, in chemical biology, the prospects of the CRISPR technique to edit and manipulate the DNA of any organism the advances of high energy physics, the standard model, and the recent detection of gravity waves um, are just some of the signposts of the excitement in the coming STEM revolution. The dedication and excitement is clear and present in the content and delivery of the postal results of all the contributors today. I applaud each and every presenter on behalf of the Armenian Engineers and Scientists of America. I also applaud the devoted and dedicated members of the ASA Science Olympiad Committee who have outdone themselves in this year's presentations. 
They'd harness the brilliant energy of the youth of the West Coast and of Armenia and Artsakh and have brought their results to us today. In particular, Asa heartily thanks Ms. Svetlana Marjunova and Ms. Sona Juhayan for their tireless and careful work in publicizing the Science Olympiad and in managing the post of presenters, their material, and the awards. And thanks also to Adam Dermadirosyan and his team for setting up the Skype, uh, Skype connections to Armenia and Artsakh uh, this morning. So I wanted then to thank you all, and I hope to see you next year in the light of new research results and new advances. Thank you. Thank you. Um, correction, I wish I were the Vice President of GCC, I'm not. Uh, I'm a Professor of Chemistry at GCC and uh, also the Division Chair of Physical Sciences. Um, the President Dr. David Weyer emailed me yesterday, last night, he had something urgent come up so they couldn't be here. Therefore, I'll take a little bit of your time, not too much, I promise. Um, first of all, I would like to, parents, students, volunteers of AESA, volunteers of GCC, thank you for doing this, for being here today. Um, it counts a lot to all of us. Uh, I wish you consider your day well spent. Uh, because I consider my day very well spent um, and in a few short years some of you might be our students on our beautiful campus which by the way was voted the second most beautiful campus in the nation. Some people make positive comments when they see it. Um, where you can also get an education which um, I'm proud to say we've been very high in transfer rate among the, all the community colleges in the area in many aspects, you can get a much better, equally good education, in some cases much better education for the age of the incoming students than a lot of even four-year schools. Um, that's my number one point. The second point uh, that I was going to make was um, now that you've been doing this, you've done this at least for the first time and if not more, um, once you come across individuals who claim they're not good in science, um, you have a counter-argument, which will not even be debatable. You will checkmate them right there, right? Science is for everybody. Science is for human beings, everybody. Um, one of the differences between the rest of the animals and us is they observe, and life passes by observing, whereas we observe and then we ask the question why or how. That's the biggest difference between us and the rest of the animals. The answer to questions why or how is the definition of science. We want to know our universe better just for the sake of knowing it better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sabada, uh, for welcoming us here. Finally, I want to invite our Science Olympiad Committee Chair, another successful engineer and leader, Sona Javarian, for her greetings and award recognition. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good? Tired? No. I know. I know the feeling. Imagine that being done for many, many days by the volunteers that we have here. That's tiring, isn't it? No? Maybe not as much as the science projects that you're working on, I'm assuming. It's harder. No? 
Yes, come on, I want to hear some reaction. Okay, fine, you guys are tired, you don't want to hear me anymore. Not this. So, I'll be really brief before we start announcing the winners. But, I just want to say welcome to the 18th annual ASA Science Olympiad. I'm very proud of everyone, every single one of you, that you had the courage to come up in, in, to this event and be judged by uh, a lot of uh, our wonderful professional judges and get the experience being interviewed more than once, uh, practicing what to say uh, about your project, about your research. Um, that's a wonderful experience that I, I wish I had when I was in high school or, or even in middle school. So um, I admire this event that's happening and the help that I'm getting from our volunteers here. Um, so I just wanted to say, without the, our sponsors, we couldn't have done this. So our major sponsors are Connecto Communications, who have helped us with the uh, setup to this Armenia. And also the live streaming that we, we've been experiencing for the last couple of years. Some parents and uh, grandparents hear it from, uh, or watch it from out of, out of country. Um, our, another sponsor, wonderful sponsor, is Glendale Community College, who, is, uh, who has made the model for our service space. Um, our IEEE has uh, donated some, uh, some money for, for our organization. And Christian Alexander, who has donated uh, the, the money for, for our students' lunch. So I want to recognize Aya De Martirosian and Elena Grigorian. They always come back and they want to bring some fun to the science uh, science Olympiad that we have, so that the kids who are waiting for judges to be seen, they can also uh, have something to do while they're waiting for the judges. And uh, how how did you like our activities for today? Which one did you like the most? Who, who has gone to the activities? Everyone. Uh, you liked all of them? Yeah. What was more, most, the most memorable? Oh, the auditorium. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I haven't been there, so I'm, I'm a little jealous that you guys get to see it. And, I, and I've been here for the last two years, and I still cannot go and see it yet. So. <laughs> Maybe one of these days I come back and get the chance to see it. Um, so we also had uh, other activities uh, held by um, some of our engineers, pneumatic engineering who brought the robotic arm uh, by Boris Avakian. And um, for those of you who, if you didn't know, we, we are starting a robotics uh, committee, or a subcommittee within ASA Science Olympiad. Um, it's a courses and a team that we're going to form, so it's open to anyone. Um, please reach out to us and uh, we'll, we'll answer any questions you may have or concerns. Um, we also had a parent workshop done by an AGPU college counselor, AGPU MDS uh, college counselor, Daniel Mehramian. And from what I gathered, it was a great uh, workshop and everyone gained a lot of information. I'm, I'm seeing some nodding there too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, Angina Aslanian from GCC Outreach uh, Services, uh, who provided some information about GCC. And how did you like Vladimir's uh, presentation? It was inspiring, wasn't it? When I, when I saw what he was going to present, I was really happy and I told him several times I really like it and I and he was nervous. Kids, did you really like it or no? Yes. Yes. It's really inspiring and I hope he takes a few points with you home. And uh, like he said, always winning is not learning. So you gotta sometimes lose to learn what, what went wrong. 
Uh, just an overview. Today we had about 80 students participating. Well, I want to say kind of a worldwide because we had Armenian and Artsakh participating this year for the first time. And I got to say it was really emotional for our volunteers and some of our judges because this is the first time it's happening. The kids are excited to be here or to be uh, presented to us. It was very emotional for all of us. And we had about 76 projects and 70, 17 schools presented. So, um, those are the schools. Um, I'll try to remember all of them. AGBU Manukya Demirjan, where are you? AGBU Vache Tamar, I'm sorry. We had a representative from Tumo, uh, is here in, in person. Um, Sahak Mesrov. Of Sethian School.
And I also want to thank our volunteers. Without them, I couldn't have done this. I, I hear a lot of thank yous from many people, but you know, it's not me alone. It's a lot. Like I have a team of uh, of members here. So Svetlana Arsunova, who's been helping us with communicating with a lot of the schools. Last week, Shakarian, uh, who's been uh, anything that I need, I can rely on her. Ari Nabek and uh, a lot of the other members. Uh, Marietta um, Madakian, who's who's been, I think, in ASA since 2001, 2002. So 18 years she's been volunteering, and she still comes back. And we don't want her to go. <laughs> So keep coming back. And I also want to mention uh, Ms. Marina Gubrekian because she started this uh, committee and she ran this for 13 years and she's been challenging me to stay for 13 years so we'll see if I can survive that long. <laughs> okay, so moving to the next uh, I just want to say thank you to our donors. We have a lot of donors. This is the, all these monetary awards that you are getting is because we have uh, sponsors or donors uh, who believe in this, um, in this committee and in this organization, and they want to see a future scientists of our like Armenian uh, scientists and engineers, and they want to encourage and uh, educate you even more for anything else that you may uh, encounter. So, and I also want to mention that uh, today we received a, another award, uh, award for second place uh, by Joseph Nazarian. Nazarian. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you for, for your generous uh, donations. So, before we start announcing the winners, I just want to mention that please uh, put this in your calendar. We will have a winner award celebration. Uh, on Friday, April 26th at 7.30 p.m. Anyone is welcome, you just, uh, when we email you, email you, please respond who's going to come, and, like, so we know um, how many people we're going to expect. Thank you. And this will be the awards for seniors and juniors categories, and we'll get started. Are you excited?
Armenia, Harutyun Abedisyan, David Hakopyan, and Arman Toneyan won the award uh, in Armenia.
Mr. and Mrs. Zaben and Sonia, I can uh, first place the word goes to a student again from Shamlian, Mikhail Baltasarian. <laughs> Thank you. 
Junior Physical Sciences. In the memory of Dr. Shahen Khanjarian, honorable mention award goes to a student from Chamyan, Grigori Prasulyan. <laughs>
and uh, the student from Rebay Academy is Mary Abrahamia. in Armenia, I will be mentioning their names. Uh, friends of Helen Dabarian and Helen Dabarian second place award will go to Elise Vadoyan and Mariam Gevorkian from Herati High School. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Emmanuel Eren Shirajan first place award will go to uh, Sophie Elizbarian, Eliz Seda Adipekian, and Meher Kurvinian from Herati High School as well. Um, I didn't know this. Can you uh, students come and like stand in front of each other or something? Because we do not want to, you to danger your safety here. The, short, uh, the shorter ones can go in front, so the taller ones can stand in the back. You to come. Thank you. Uh, that summarizes our uh, uh, winners in senior life sciences. Uh, we'll go to the senior physical sciences. In the memory of Harvik Hovnanyan, honorable mention the word. Uh, we'll go to a student in uh, in Armenia. I I don't remember their school name, so I apologize for that. Uh, the st the students are Haritun Avedisian, David Hagopian, uh, Are Grigorian, and Arman Soneyan. Um, Dr. Agbavian Ag and Family Third Place Award will go to um, students in, in Artsakh, uh, Anna Hartunyan, uh, Gerham Khayamyan. Um, the, the next ones. Vani Godoshian, a second place award will go to Mary Uygan from uh, Rebay Academy. Gyurgyan Family First Place Award goes to a, uh, a student from AGB Vache and Tamar Mandukyan High School, Michael Gurevian.
Okay, that concludes our uh, winners in senior uh, physical sciences. Next up is the senior robotics and engineering category. And uh, we have the Vestigia Family Honorable Mention Award that goes to uh, the student from Tumo Center, uh, Arman Begnaria. <laughs> Okay. Guys, we need to take a picture. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm